it just left a huge smile on my face and I was just like, ah, oh, what a good movie. Hello everybody, it has been a hot minute since I posted a video due to a lot of different personal things going on and I am going to touch on that a bit in my next video, but for now I thought with 2020, 2021, 20, what year is it? 2021 coming to an end, somehow, already, what is time? I just wanted to highlight all of the great amazing films that we got this year before we start 2022. 2022, 2022. How did we get here? Coming in at number 10. Come on, come on. This movie made my little Grinch heart grow three sizes that day. It's so full of love and emotion and simultaneously somehow made me want to have 10 children and also made me want to never have children ever because wow, that looks exhausting. Joaquin Phoenix is obviously incredible. No surprise there. I really don't need to convince you that he's great in this film. It's fucking Joaquin Phoenix. The black and white cinematography is stunning. It really adds to the rawness of the film, to the fact that it's just people, it's just conversations. This is a movie that is primarily dialogue and it's also kind of interwoven with this documentary that the main character is making. And so parts of it actually feel like documentary. So I think the black and white contributes to that. It just sort of bleeds the line between reality and like a scripted feature, which I thought was really interesting and very unique. It's kind of about parenthood, but also not really. And just being human and understanding your emotions and knowing that it's okay to be vulnerable and to validate your emotions and to just feel. It's okay to feel and stand in the woods and scream at the top of your lungs. And I just made me feel so much and I friggin' loved it. This movie is just so unique and so special to me. The fact that it's only at number 10 means that this is a goddamn good list. <laughs> okay, here we go. Number nine. The Mitchells versus the Machines. Dare I say this kind of took the concept of don't look up and made it good? Can we all agree here? Side note, I did not like Don't Look Up. I hated it. I don't want to talk about it right now because this is not a video to talk about bad movies, but I just want to say I did not like that movie. Now, we had so many amazing animated films this year between Luca and Encanto, and there was so much to choose from, and I really wanted to put all of them on this list, but when I was looking at them all, I had written them all down, and I was like, you know what? As much as I truly adore every single one of these films, The Mitchells vs. the Machines is the one that stuck with me the most and is the one that I think I thoroughly enjoyed from beginning to end the most. Doesn't mean those other ones aren't also incredible and you should watch each and every one of them, but I think this one was my personal favorite. It was just an absolute blast. I think the animation style was really unique, very like artistic and kind of comic bookish. It sort of reminded me of like Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse a, a little bit at certain points. And the animation kind of added to the depth of the main character because she's like an artist and she doodles and she makes films and so it was sort of like the film was kind of partially made from her perspective which i thought was really interesting i think the characters are really nuanced and this family dynamic is so real but also really endearing and heartwarming and wholesome and you just love every single one of them the story of like a family fighting together to overcome this like weird technological apocalypse is so like funny and quirky, but also heartwarming and touching. And you just want to root for them. And I'm sorry if you can hear my dog crying. He's sitting outside the door and all he wants to do is come inside and hang out with me, but I'm shooting a video, Bodie. I'm sorry. I'll be out in a second. There is also a ridiculously absurd scene involving killer Furbies, and it will remain one of the greatest scenes of cinema that I've ever seen of all time. So there's that. Coming in at number eight, The Ninth House. Dude, it's so good, it's so good. It made me stressed, depressed, and impressed. There are only two horror movies on my list this year because I was unfortunately just very let down by most of the horror that came out this year, at least the ones that I did get a chance to see. Like everything that I was excited about, I didn't really like. A lot of them I hated. Maybe there were some that came out that I just didn't know about, but this was definitely, well, this was my second favorite horror that came out this year because the other one is also on this list and I haven't gotten to it yet, but 
I freaking love this movie. It's probably one of my favorite horror films to come out within the past several years, not just this year. Like it just really stuck with me. I still think about it like on a weekly basis and I definitely want to watch it again because it was just so interesting and I loved it. I, I would say as a horror, it isn't particularly very scary. It's kind of like a psychological thriller, but the whole premise is that the story kind of asks this question, is it mental illness or is it monsters? Which I've always really loved. I, I always love the idea of like the monster or the villain being kind of an allegory for something more real. I think that's why I'm such a big fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer because the entire premise is like, what if all your high school demons were real demons? And like, I don't know, I just freaking love shit like that. It's, it's so good when it's done right when it's done right, let me clarify. I just really love the exploration of grief and neurodivergence and how the film makes you question if you have an unreliable narrator the whole time. Like, is she reliable or is she actually just losing her mind? You just can't figure it out. And I think it's so fun to watch and try and like piece together what's happening because she doesn't even know what's happening. And she's the one narrating the story and pulling you through it. So if you can't trust her, you don't know what the fuck's going on. And I just love that. I love when a movie does that. Not to mention the like architectural horror of this house is so creepy and unsettling and cool. It's so cool. It's weird and it's beautiful and it's like enchanting to watch. And I just, ugh, I just loved it. I think the ending in particular was very poignant and like, I don't know, this movie has just lingered with me since I saw it and I am itching to watch it again. Number seven, The Power of the Dog. All right, so this one was definitely a slow burn. It kind of took me a while to get into it. It was kind of one of those movies where I was like, everybody's talking about this. Uh, I should probably watch it. There's a lot of like hubba baloo going on about this movie. And as a movie person in the movie community, I feel like I have this obligation to watch it. So it was on Netflix and I just kind of threw it on. I don't know why I wasn't like invest. Like it has, it stars Benedict Cumberbatch, who I love. It also stars Kirsten Dunst, who I love. And I was just like, not, there was just something about her. I was like, oh, this just looks like kind of like a boring ass movie to me, if I'm being honest. But I put it on and I watched it anyways. And I freaking loved it. It was so good. It was so good. To be honest, I wasn't even really sure how I felt about it at first. It took me like several days to process what I had seen. And I love when a movie does that. I love when it just like sticks with you and lingers with you and is like, hey, maybe you should think about this a little bit and maybe it'll, it'll mean something. And it does, and it did, and that happened. And I was like, what? So it is a Western of sorts. And it also adds to uh, one of my favorite subgenres of cinema, which is depressed Kirsten Dunst. And what begins as like a slow burn character study slowly unravels into this weird, twisted, brilliant and enthralling story that's like so carefully crafted and delicately written that you just might miss it if you don't look too closely. Like you really have to pay attention to this movie, otherwise you will completely miss the point. But I think I will be thinking about this movie and about the ending. I will be thinking about that ending for the rest of my life. That's it, that's all I got. Number six, Coda. This movie is the epitome of this emoji. Coda stands for Child of Deaf Adults, and the movie follows this girl named Ruby, who is a child of deaf adults. She is the only hearing person in her entire family. Ironically, she has a passion for singing, and she's really good at it. So she's torn between pursuing her love of music and between taking care of her family, who she has taken care of her whole life. So she's like their interpreter. She helps them with daily tasks. She helps them with their family business. So she's torn with this like, do I follow my dreams and do what I like feel like I was born to do and follow my passions? Or do I take this family obligation and take care of my family and give up on my passions? So it's this really interesting internal conflict that like truly is like very difficult because Honestly, if I was in that position, I have no idea what I would do, but it's so well written and these characters you just can't help but love. And it's this heartwarming tale of the importance of family and the importance of following your dreams 
and how to balance the two. And it just made me really feelsy and the music is so good. And it just, it just left a huge smile on my face and I was just like, ah, oh, what a good movie. All right, we're into the top five now. Yes, we are. But this one I loved so much that now that I'm looking at this list, I'm like, should it be number four? Number three, number two even? Like I freaking love this movie. So number five, Tick, Tick, Boom. The Andrew Garfield Renaissance is here and I am here for it. I have watched this movie three times now. I have listened to the soundtrack about a thousand times and it just gets better every single time. Like I'm just kind of, I'm kind of becoming obsessed with it. It's becoming a problem, honestly, in my life. Like I just walk around, this is the life, ba bo ba bo bo You know, it really, it really just speaks to me on a deep spiritual level in every single way. Uh, so Tick Tick Boom is a musical. It's on Netflix, it stars Andrew Garfield, and it is an adaptation of the musical slash one man show kind of stage show. I don't really know what you call it. I guess it was a musical written by Johnny Larson who is more famously known as the guy that wrote Rent, the musical. And if you don't know the like tragic story of Johnny Larson, he struggled his entire life to be a playwright. He just worked as a waiter in a diner and like barely got by, but he never gave up on his passion for writing. And he just wrote a bunch of musicals until something stuck. And finally he wrote Rent and it went on Broadway and it was a huge success. But the night before it first premiered, he died. He was like 35 and he never got to see it. And he never got to enjoy the successes of his work. And it's like, it's just so tragic and like such a weird twist of fate that this happened to him. But anyways, Tick, Tick, Boom was written before Rent and it was like probably his first success. I don't even really know how successful it was, but anyways, it's sort of like a memoir of musicals. It's all about his life and it's about his struggles of trying to become a writer, but it's told like in musical form. <laughs> now I'm a sucker for musicals. Like I'm a huge sucker for musicals. So it's not very surprising that this would end up in my top five, but this one just has a very, very special place in my heart. Like I, I'm not a playwright, but I personally identify like as a struggling artist or a, just as a creative person who's like hustling and trying to get by, but like never really sticking. Like I've been making YouTube videos for probably 15 years. 15 years. I know I've been reviewing movies for nine years, but I did some stuff before that that we don't talk about. <laughs> and I did some stuff in between that that we don't talk about. You know, I've just been trying all sorts of things and I, I write books. I write books. I start books that I don't finish. I write music that I never do anything with. Like I'm always like struggling to make something. Like I just want to make something. I want to make art. I want to, I just want to be somebody. <laughs> I'm getting really passionate. This is how much I love this movie and how much it resonated with me. Like I just, I just, I get it. I get it. I'm no, nowhere near as talented as Johnny Larson and I don't think anyone really is. I think he's a truly one of a kind human being. And you can really see that in this movie and Andrew Garfield, plays him so amazingly incredibly well. Like, like he gets his mannerisms down, his singing is incredible. I'm pretty sure he didn't even know how to sing before this movie. So that's like super impressive on its own. Anyways, just seeing someone who's like so severely struggling in his life, just keep going and like his drive and his passion for art and for the love of what he was making just kept him going no matter what is so inspiring to me. It's also harrowing. It's also funny. It's really funny. He's such a likable, lovable character, even though he makes a lot of mistakes and he's like kind of an idiot at times. You just like love him. You can't help but love him and respect his ambition, I guess. Not to mention the music is incredible and literally every single song slaps so hard. I think every day since I watched it, I've had a different song stuck in my head and it won't stop. It's getting a little, it's getting a little ridiculous if I'm being honest. Like I need, like get out of my head, Johnny. Get out of my head. Number four, Shiva Baby. Oh baby, Shiva Baby, what a film. What a picture. Ooh, ah, yes. I had Shiva Baby as my number one film of the year for a while, since I first saw it. It was at my number one and I was like, nothing's topping this. 
this movie's so friggin' good. It's, it's so good. It's so good. And then I saw a couple other things and got bumped up to number four, but it was number one for a very long time, until probably a month ago. This movie was just so funny and quirky and stressful as hell and so relatable, so relatable to the point that it made me cry. I don't think any other movie on this list made me cry. Well, Tick, Tick, Boom made me cry like a little bit, but this one like ugly tears, sobbing, which I did not expect also because this movie, it, it's sort of like pitched to you as a comedy and it is a comedy, but it's also a very real, maybe it's a dramedy. I don't know, not the point. Point is fucking love this movie. I'm not Jewish, by the way. I've never been to a Shiva. I didn't even know what that was until I saw this movie and I learned a lot about it, but like, but I also think that doesn't matter because it's not really about that. Like that's the setup, that's the premise. I'm sure it resonates with that crowd uh, probably a lot more than it resonated with me, but it still resonated with me so much because it's more about like being at an awkward family gathering and dealing with all of the pressure and the judgment and the never ending questions about like, who are you dating? What are you doing? What's your job? Why don't you have a boyfriend? Why aren't you married? Why don't you have kids? Why aren't you more like so-and-so? Oh, look, it's your sister. She's doing this. And it's just like, you know, that like grueling, exhausting social interaction of any kind of family gathering. That's what this movie is. The whole movie just takes place at a shiva, which is a funeral. It's just like, it's like a Jewish funeral, I guess. Again, not Jewish. Don't ask me anything about what a shiva is, but as far as I have understood, it's basically just a funeral. But especially as a 20 something year old woman who has still not really figured out her life, uh, this really hit home for me. Like a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot, like a lot. It made me laugh so hard that I snorted. It made me cry unexpectedly, very ugly, gross, snotty tears. It's funny. It's heartwarming. It's gay. It's so gay. It's so gay. We love it. We love to see it. I just freaking love this movie. I loved it with all of my being. Number three, The Green Knight. This could be the part of the video where I brag about having a degree in both English and film and how I am a big ass nerd for Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and how it's possibly one of the most profound pieces of literature ever written, but I'm just such a big fan. I'm just such a big fan and I was so excited about this movie. This was one of the most like highly anticipated films of the year for me because I really, really, really loved the Arthurian legend. And when I tell you that I screamed when I heard that A24 was making an adaptation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight starring Dev Patel. I can't, I lost my mind. I lost my mind. Literally a movie made just for me. I, I have perished. I, I am done, I am dead, I am deceased. I am unsubscribing from life itself. Seriously, this movie is fucking incredible. <laughs> Even if you've never read Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, you absolutely don't need to read that. I'm just geeking out about it because I really, really love it. But this movie like alone by itself is a goddamn work of art. And it's also very easily digestible, which was surprising to me because I thought like, okay, this is kind of a heavy story. It's a little bit weird. I don't know how well it's gonna convey on the screen, especially because it's like, you know, it's a weird A24 movie. A lot of their movies are kind of difficult to follow. Sometimes I watch a movie and I'm like, I just don't really, I just don't really get that. Like personally, not a huge fan of The Lobster. I know a lot of people love The Lobster. I fucking hate that movie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't do it. It, it's, it is so fucking stupid. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. Anyway, not the point. Um, where was I going with this? The Green Knight. <laughs> you absolutely do not need to read or know anything about the story going into it because it's very easy to follow. It's probably one of the least like pretentious A24 movies that they've ever come out with. Even though it doesn't look like it would be, it, it is, trust me. It, don't be intimidated by this movie. More or less, it's an adventure. It's like, an, it is an Arthurian legend. So it's about Sir Gawain, who was one of the Knights of the Round Table for King Arthur, which is cool. That's just cool. But as an adventure, instead of it being fueled by like action and exploration, you know, like an epic journey, it's more fueled by like the dread and the impending doom of how this is gonna end. Because you kind of learn at the very beginning in the first scene, how it is potentially going to end, which is such a cool format for a story because it's so suspenseful and you're just like, 
you're just so full of dread and you have no idea what's going to happen or when it's going to happen and you can feel the character's dread and it just gets like more and more stressful as the movie progresses but it's also so beautiful and bewitching and you're so enchanted by all the cinematography and it's in this like beautiful medieval forest and the performances and the set design and the fact that Dev Patel has a freaking jerk off belt but that is not the point neither here nor there we don't need to talk about that I love this movie I love the ambiguous ending I love how close they stuck to the original source material because I really didn't think they were gonna do that but they did which is awesome and above all else I fucking love Dev Patel Number two. This is probably a surprise to no one because I am a huge slut for Edgar Wright. I love every movie he has ever made. Uh, he, he might be my favorite director of all time. If he comes out with any movie at any time, I am like, I, I have to see that. I have to see that right now, immediately. And I don't know if there's any other director that has the same effect on me, like where I'm like, I physically will die if I do not see his new movie. You know what I mean? So yeah, probably my favorite director. <laughs> um, so the movie that I'm talking about, by the way, number two, Last Night in Soho. I just, I just love Edgar Wright. His movies are so fun. They're so stylized. The soundtrack always slaps without fail. And while you can usually tell if one of his movies was directed by Edgar Wright, none of them are like the same. Like they're all very different. They all have their own style. It's sort of like they're all in the same font family, but none of them are the same font. They're all in the same color palette but none of them are the same color. I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but I'm kind of struggling, but you get what I'm saying. I just like how we always bring something fresh and new to the screen. And once again, this one did not disappoint. Also shout out to the other film that he released this year that no one's talking about, which is the documentary called The Sparks Brothers, which is a documentary on Netflix, all about the band The Sparks, who you may or may not have heard of. They're kind of a weird, obscure band, but they're one of my personally favorite bands. And if you haven't heard of The Sparks, I would still recommend it. I actually think I'd recommend it more if you haven't heard of The Sparks, because that's, that's kind of the point. That's kind of their thing, is that like nobody really knows who they are, but they're somehow really successful. It's hard to explain. Anyways, really, really good documentary. It's on Netflix. I highly recommend it. Not the point of this video, but I just, just Edgar Wright, just Edgar Wright, Edgar Wright is doing it right. Anyways, Last Night in Soho is sort of a psychological horror thriller through time and space. Well, I, I guess just through time, not really space. It stars Thomas and Mackenzie and Anya Taylor-Joy. What a dynamic duo. So it follows this young girl in the present day who is studying to be a fashion designer in London. She starts like mysteriously bouncing back and forth between the present day and the 1960s in London and she encounters this dazzling wannabe singer and at first she like idolizes her and is kind of obsessed with her. She's kind of an old soul so she really resonates with this like 1960s lifestyle but then she sees that things are a little bit darker than they seem and she gets caught in this web of like this weird spellbinding murder mystery. It's so much fun. It is completely unpredictable. It's just like a fever dream of technicolor and neon lights and it's just so it's so beautiful it's so beautiful it's so beautifully shot like the way that the present day and the past tense kind of swirl together there's so many really beautiful scenes that show that happening and the trans i mean edgar wright is without a doubt a king of transitions like he's always been really good at them but in this particular movie they really shine because it's not just a transition from place to place but it's a transition from time to different time. And the way he does it is so seamless and beautiful and creative. Ugh, ugh. I could just geek out about this movie for like 12 hours straight. I was also just on the edge of my seat throughout the entire movie, just completely bewitched, like eyes glued to the screen, could not look away. And you know when you're watching a movie and you get like, I don't know, like halfway through and you have this thought, at least me, at least I do this. I like have this thought and I'm like, yeah, this is the best movie I've seen in a long time. <laughs> I was just so enthralled by this film. I was like, wow, I can't believe I get to watch this. This is awesome. Also, who doesn't want to see Matt Smith star in another timey wimey wibbly wobbly story? Like, come on. Number one. We've done it. We've made it to number one. 
Yes, we have. Has anybody guessed it? Does anyone know what it is? I will say I don't think it really aligns with the rest of this list. This is probably one of my most like, I hate, I hate this word because it's so like judgmental, but I can't really figure out another word for it. But I feel like this is probably my most like pretentious top 10 list that I've ever made. Usually it's a lot more like superhero movies or like silly stupid comedies or rom-coms or blockbusters which is fine by the way i love all of those movies i well, probably watch more rom-coms than any other kind of movie but for some reason this year there were just a lot of really good like dramas that i really liked i don't know i think a lot of the times when it's like award season and the oscar nominees are announced i just like personally don't really love most of those movies that are nominated sometimes sometimes i like them all this year i actually think i probably will like them all judging by like my speculation but most of the time they're they're just a little pretentious they're just not made for like normal people <laughs> i don't know how to say this without coming off like a dick but i just you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I should have written this down so I could have said it more eloquently, but I'm just sort of stream of consciousness talking. I'm also very tired. The point is, this movie that I'm about to talk about is probably not most people's number one movie of the year, but I'm just gonna get right into it. Number one, Spider-Man No Way Home. I feel like I'm gonna get a lot of mixed reactions over this one, and that's okay, that's fine. This is my list, this is my channel. I can do whatever the fuck I want. But look, for me, for me personally, this list is all about movies that I enjoyed. <laughs> I don't really need to have to explain that, but to some people I do. It isn't about what I think is like technically the best or the movies with the most merit, like cinematic merit. You know, it's just movies that I watch and I enjoyed. And I was like, yeah, that was a fucking good movie. You know, it's, it's nothing more than that. It's not that complex. It's not that serious. It's just movies and we go to the movies to have a good time, you know? And when I tell you, this was a good fucking time. <laughs> what? Like, if a film lingers with me, if a film evokes some kind of emotional response within me, if it makes me think about something differently, gives me new perspective, or just like brightens my day, that is what matters to me. That is why I love movies so, so much. So yeah, Spider-Man No Way Home was absolutely, without a doubt, my favorite movie of the year. No question. Yes, you could argue that this movie was fan service, but it was fan service done right, you know? It was like, it made sense. It was interwoven with the plot of the story in a way that made sense. And most importantly, it was the most fun I have ever had at the movies in years probably since Avengers Endgame. That was probably the last time I had just as much fun because this was like on the same scale of spectacle. Like it was a different kind of spectacle, but it was so surreal. It was, it was surreal to watch this movie. That is the best word I can use to describe this movie. Surreal. Spoiler alert if you have not seen Spider-Man No Way Home yet because I am about to talk about some things that are spoilers. So be warned. Spider-Man spoilers coming your way in three, two, one. Seeing Spider-Man take off his mask and reveal that he is Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker, I just... Ah! Ah! <laughs> Seeing Tobey Maguire reluctantly walk through this portal, looking all old and haggard and like he's been through some shit, but still had that adorable, sweet little Peter Parker smile on his face. Seeing all three Spideys that I grew up with and cherished and obsessively watched their movies over and over again, all three web swinging through New York City, web swinging off of each other, landing in their like iconic poses one by one next to each other on one big screen right in front of me. Like the only way I can describe this movie is that it was surreal. It was so, so surreal. And above all else, it was the best experience I had going to the movies this whole year, without a doubt. It was the best. It made me laugh. It made me cry. It made me feel so much. And it made me nostalgic in the best way that didn't feel forced. It just felt like, yes, I think this is why I love Spider-Man. This is why I love superhero movies. And it reminded me of that because I think I've been going through this sort of superhero fatigue and i think we all have like as a community i think a lot of us are just like fucking tired of superhero movies you know like it's it's tired it has been done and i was feeling that even though i love 
comic books and I grew up with comic books and I grew up with all these superheroes and like it is a part of me and it's a part of my childhood and watching this just sort of reminded me of that it gave me this nostalgia of like I I do love I love this this is a part of me why have I been like like I still haven't seen Eternals because I was just like I just don't care it took me so long to see Shang-Chi because I just didn't fucking care then I saw it and I loved it. That's like, I think that's like my number 14 of the year or something. It, it was in my top 10 for a while, but then it got bumped up. But I really loved that movie. But like, I've just been in this weird fatigue where I didn't want superhero movies. Like I didn't even watch, I don't think I even saw all the trailers for Spider-Man because I was like, I'm just so tired, you know? But this movie reminded me why I love superhero movies. It reminded me where it all started, of my childhood and what I grew up with, and why I've always related so much to Peter Parker. And above all, it just reminded me why I love movies and why I love going to a theater with a bunch of people who also love movies and like hearing them cheer and hearing them get excited getting excited as a group collectively with a bunch of strangers because you all are here for the same thing and you all love the same thing and it, there's, it's just powerful man it's just there's just something powerful about that I don't know I didn't mean to get all deep and emotional over a spider-man movie but man I just fucking love movies ugh I love movies, and God damn it, I love Andrew Garfield more than life itself. Anyways, that's it. That's my top 10 favorite movies of the year 2021. Crazy that that year is over already. We're in 2022 now. What the fuck is happening? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed my list. If you didn't, suck my dick. If you want to see all of the movies that I watched this year ranked, you can go to my letterbox, which I will have blah, 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 blah. I will have linked in the doobly-doo, doobly-doobly-doo. And you can see my whole list ranked from one to, I don't know, 70 something. I can't remember how many 2021, 2021 movies I watched this year, but they're all on the list and they're all ranked and I reviewed most of them. So check it out if you wanna. Also follow me on letterbox. I need more letterbox friends. I never talk about it. I never, you know, I never plug my letterbox because to me, it's not really social media. It's just like where I personally log things for my, like, cause I forget stuff and I want to remember what I saw, but it'd be cool to like hang out and talk to people on there. Anyways, I digress. That's my top 10 favorite movies of 2021. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what your top 10 or your top three or your top one or whatever. Let me know what movies this year you watched that you loved in the comments below. There are so many movies that I still haven't gotten a chance to see that probably would have made it onto this list, but I just haven't gotten around to it. And that's kind of why I didn't put this video out until now because I was trying to like finish all the movies and catch up. And then at one point I was like, there's just no way I'm gonna watch all these movies. Like there's just no way. <laughs> I just need to cut myself off right here. Here's my list. There might be some things that could have made it into this list, but they didn't because I didn't see them. So there we are. And I'm starting to lose my voice. <clears throat> so I'm gonna stop this video right now. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.